You're the guy that's like turbo and lowered 95 at hotmail.com. Totally, right? man. That's, that's, I'm, t- I'm still rocking the hotmail. Hey, podcast listener. Even if you are alone in your entrepreneurial journey, know that today, right now in your earbuds, you are joined by thousands of entrepreneurs from all around the globe seeking to grow better, more profitable, location-independent businesses. If you'd like to learn more about what we do and download our entire back catalog, check out tropicalmba.com. Yeah, buddy. Happy Thursday morning. It's the Tropical MBA podcast. This one's at tropicalmba.com slash updates. Bongiorno, boss man. I can see you coming through very clearly on the, on the Skype there. I think we might be able to interrupt each other this episode more effectively. Yeah, we're both in good internet connection this week. So, uh, yeah, you're in Italy. How's that? It's uh, can't complain, man. Eating pizza and pasta professionally. <laughs> did you uh, did you find that cheese again? Yeah, the burrata cheese. I'm just stuffing my face with it, man. I got a bunch of pictures of this stuff just sitting on all different kinds of burrata on pizza, burrata on lettuce, burrata on this. So, yeah, it's been... you're going crazy for that. That's it's awesome good. that you found it. Again. I'm gonna get into the import racket, man. I'm out of the internet business. I'm importing. Bur- I'm importing burrata cheese. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're, uh, I'm curious. I saw a, a race car. A race car. With the Dynamite Circles logo on it, we're going to post it at this one, tropicalmba.com slash updates. By the way, let me just introduce what's going on with this whole episode here. We're just we're getting a little bit too casual here, man. Hold up a second. Let's get pro. This episode, we are going to talk about some specific updates to our projects. Our manufacturing business, we've had some manufacturing dramas. We're going to share with them how you can get started manufacturing, saving money, a lot of people in our community, they're like, with the drop shipping episode, Ian, they're like, hey, that's great. We want to manufacture too, but it's too darn expensive. How can we do it cheaply? We're going to share with you some thoughts on that. We're going to talk about how design is winning in our business. You know, with our product business, we've seen 100% year over year growth. So we're going to talk about some of the challenges that we've seen with that. We're also going to talk about how Ian's love affair with Adam Carolla might finally be paying real business dividends. So stick around for that. Uh, in the meat and potatoes. But I want to hear about what you're doing with the race car and the Dynamite Circle logo, because that's really exciting to see that. Uh, Yeah. All right. So I took a little bit of a break, came back to San Diego, and have been going up to San Francisco, actually, uh, to go race the last couple of weekends. So we're at Thunder Hill last weekend. We'll be at Laguna Seca at the end of the month. And uh, of course, man, had to put a Dynamite Circle logo on the race car, it's funny when you sign up, you can list your sponsors, and, and some people put funny things in there, you know. So, anyways, it, the announcer's saying funny things over the uh, the PA system. I put Dynamite Circle in there because that's the official sponsor of the new Spec Miata, and so he has to say it out loud. So you're in the pits and you hear it come out, and you're like, "Yeah, buddy." Speaking of uh, cool things, I, you know, you were mentioning that you actually made a connection vis-a-vis the blogosphere up there. Can you share with us that story? Yeah, shout out to Brian. We've actually never met. We've just met actually online. So I was reading Patrick McKenzie's blog, Calzumius, as uh, as as we do. And uh, on as Patrick's blog, somebody left a comment, and it was this guy Brian, and and his avatar was a little race car. And so I clicked on it, and then I figured out, <laughs> hey, this is the guy that it's runs. Like, I love it's like it's like an Ian trap. Oh yeah, you know, like a little picture, like you know when you were a kid and you loved <laughs> the picture of the fast car. That's like. It's like when you sign up for a forum, bro. You're still that guy. That's like, hold on, I don't have my picture. My my race car isn't the avatar, but Brian's is. So he tipped me off. So, anyways, Brian runs a motorsport reg. You're the guy that's like turbo and lowered ninety five at hotmail dot com. Totally, right? man. That's, that's I'm t- I'm still rocking the hotmail. Anyways, let me get the story out here. So Brian owns, and you guys should check out this uh, company because it's a cool niche, Motorsport Reg. And basically what he does is he runs the software that runs the online registration for all these race groups. So it used to be like you send in a check in the mail and then you get your registration. Well, now you can do your registration for all these races. And obviously car racing is his niche, but there's a lot of other companies that do it for you know uh, triathlons and whatnot. So his niche is road racing specifically and so he runs the software for this stuff and so he commented on there and I, and I, I i contacted him because that's the kind of guy that i am like you said can't pass up a race car avatar anyways uh, blogosphere serendipity man i love it speaking of serendipity 
A bunch of people have been stopping by iTunes to review this very show, Ian. Colby, who's the hustler in chief at worlddental.org, says, first of all, let me say that not once have I ever written a review, not for a podcast, not for a book. I don't know if I'm going to get this out again. Not even for that spunk acupressure mat that I bought on Amazon that feels so amazing. So you know, this is legit. There are too many podcasts focused on internet marketing, and they seem just scared of building a real business where they might actually have to get off your computer make a cold call and do these awful things that Ian and I are talking about, like manage employees and have an inventory and whatnot. Screw that. TMBA is definitely a breath of fresh air. Thank you, Colby, who advocates downloading the first 50 episodes, which you can find at tropicalmba.com. <laughs> Wait a minute. So you're not going to go into it? Okay, I'm going to go into it. <laughs> so in the second half of Colby's message, he tells us... This is awesome. Yeah, he tells us how... So after listening to five episodes yesterday, while snow plowing in my lifted Tundra 5.7, V8, yeah, buddy. Okay. That's an awesome truck. <laughs> I love it, Colby. Thank you for <laughs> writing it. I love it how he distinguished between... yes. I have the 5.7, not the 4.6. Right. I mean, Got it. Like, the, <laughs> My kind of people call That's exactly you. right. Like, you do not rock the 4.6 engine if you're a listener to the Tropical MBA podcast. No. <laughs> we, we need that extra <laughs> torque. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, man. That's great. Uh, we love these reviews, by the way. <laughs> Thank you for this. How about this one, Ian? I know you're going to love this one. Tyson writes, they need to charge for this. The information these guys share is amazing. They're like my go-to guide. And anything, it's straight to the point. They don't give you vague insights. They have a list of things, and they get through it. It's all laid out on the table. This is my favorite podcast. Thank you, Tyson. Ian, of course, has sent the invoice in the mail. Hopefully, we'll have somewhat of a, a succinct episode this weekend. What do you say we just jump right into it? All right, Ian, like I said, I really like Startups for the Rest of Us. As you know, we're big fans of what Rob and Mike do. And they have these episodes like every two or three months where they just sort of walk through precisely what's going on in some of their businesses. And I really like that. I like to see how they think about the problems that they're facing and the narrative of sort of what they're building. And so I decided, you know, why not? Why don't we do that? I was listening to their episode the other day and I thought we should do one of those. So let's get started with some of the lessons we've learned with working with our Chinese suppliers over the last, oh, seven years or so. <laughs> Oy vey. Wow. So I want you to let, but yesterday, I mean, uh, what was it? Two weeks ago, you sent me an email. I, I love like, uh, Chris Ducker one time said businesses are like, you know, ducks paddling on the surface. Like on the surface, they look like really serene and just chilling and, and, and flying around the pond and stuff. But if you look underneath the water, it's just churning like crazy. And that's the case, of course, with our manufacturing business, even though, you know, we're selling products and we're gaining customers year over year. You know, if you look, you know, all week long, we put up with crap. You know, we come on the show, have some fun, share some jokes, talk about traveling around. But it's like, oh, this is messed up or, you know, you guys owe us money or it's this or it's that or it's the other thing. So you sent me an email the other week that was like, I forget what the tagline was, but it was like, I've in seven years, I've never seen this. Yeah. And I just forwarded it to you and it's like, oh, geez. Yeah, it is like that, man. And it's it's never ending. Just when you think it's going to go smoothly, it doesn't. And it's just something like this. And so, hey, but you know what? Like, let me just say, like, that's being an entrepreneur. You know, like, I, I like this idea of stepping up and taking responsibility. I mean, putting up with crap for a living is what a lot of us do. And because we do that, we get extraordinary re rewards. Yeah. So, hey, if you just want to go around and do whatever you want every day and, you know, take it easy or whatever, cool, you know? How's that working out for you? But when I, when I look at people that are, that are building businesses that are meaningful, those businesses, it might not have to be you on a day-to-day -day basis, but those businesses are solving complex problems, and that means putting up with crazy emails like you're going to tell us about. So. so I'll tell you a little bit of insight. This, uh, this relates to the last episode that we did, Dan. We were talking about drop shipping and why you should start manufacturing on your own. And uh, that's something that we did very early on. We started manufacturing our own products, and that's uh, been a great business for us. So one of our suppliers that we've uh, been working with for the past uh, five years caught us going behind their back. 
essentially. And I'll explain what I mean by that. First, I want to thank Peter Keller from Fringe Sport, and I want to thank uh, Matt Kowalik, because uh, those guys, uh, they're both manufacturing in China, and I consulted with them on this issue, and they had some really good insights. So I'll share their insights into this too, because we had never come across this before. So basically what happened was we had been manufacturing this one product with this factory in China. We're, we're a transparent show now, bro. Let's just open kimono which which product was it it was a, one of our podiums or one of our valet podiums okay you know we're doing a fair amount of volume and we're manufacturing this product and last year the factory came to us and we have a good relationship with this factory they've helped us develop many products when i say helped us to develop many products i mean that we've come to them with low order volumes and we've ramped it up with them basically so we said hey if you can help us do this product it's i know it's only 25 units but we think it's going to be a thousand units by the end of the year they agree to it with the with the idea that it's actually going to be a thousand units so They've helped us develop many products over the years. This one product, we have to have it. It's one of our valet podiums, and we have to have it. If we go out of stock, the business suffers greatly. And last year, the factory came to us and said, hey, guys, we had placed a purchase order on the desk. They said, hey, guys, thanks for the purchase order. Just want to let you know, we're kind of getting to be a big deal now. We've got some bigger factories in in line with you, and sorry, we're going to have to push you back, and your lead time is going to be double what it was earlier this year while we get through these other bigger clients that we have. And so from our perspective, we thought, okay, this sucks. This is this is not good, but we've got a plan. So we're going to go to another factory and we're going to see if they can make this product for us because we need some diversity. If this ever happens again, we need to be in a position where we're not going to go out of stock. So that's exactly what we did. We went to another factory. We had them manufacture the product for $20 less a unit. And that was pretty substantial given the price of the unit. The production came in and it was great. And so what we did was we continued to order with this new factory because it promoted diversity in our factories. And this is a dangerous play, as we found out, because eventually our initial supplier found out somehow. I don't know. There's a lot of different ways that they could have found out. I'm not you know, exaggerating when I say there's a billion people in China. So I mean, what's going on? I mean, how are these people finding each other? Well, there's a couple different ways that they can find each other. So number one, we're pretty sneaky, but we're consolidating containers. So we'll send one container to another factory. Mm. The other thing, and you know, I wouldn't put this by some of the people that we work with in, in China, but I mean, it could have been that one of our sourcing agents tipped them off. I don't really think that's the case here, but that is a possibility. You know, you never know in China who's getting a piece of what pie. So if the commissions weren't as good at the second factory as they were at the first factory, they could have tipped them off and said, hey, we got to move back to this first factory. So, so, so this is a case of supplier bullying. I mean, we've dealt, I mean, it's always a case of who's got the upper hand. So our supplier, maybe for the first time in our relationship over many years has decided we're losing the upper hand here. Your prices are going to go up. Your lead times are going to go up. And I think it was interesting. Could you go into a little bit like what, how Matt and Peter's experience in China sort of weighed into this? They had some interesting perspectives on this. Yeah. So the threat was this. The threat is if you don't if you don't order this unit with us, if you continue to order this unit with your secondary factory, we're going to increase the price of all of your other units by 30%. And obviously that's not sustainable. And the email that came across our desk was very emotional. It was like, I can't believe that you went behind our back. I can't believe that you did this to us. We've been your partner for so long. And while I can identify with that, we kind of have to sit down and kind of sift through it and figure out what's really going on. And I think Peter Keller and Matt's responses were, were pretty good. And there's a couple of things that could have going, been going on. Number one, because we purchased so many of these products, the factory could have been getting some kind of material discount that was affecting the rest of their pricing. So that means there was just so much steel in this one product that we produced that it's affecting the steel prices for all the other clients that they have. Number one. Number two, now I want to let me let me let me focus on this particular point because this kind of thing is the kind of thing that we've regularly found out about our suppliers after the fact and I've almost never heard it in, in with one of our suppliers where they've effectively communicated what's really going on from their perspective. It always comes across as like a bullying or a a negotiating tactic or an obstinance. Like, remember that powder coating issue with the portable bars a few years ago? Like, they were just like, no way we can lower the price. There's absolutely no way. And it, had, it turned out that they had a certain powder coating supplier for the 
the color that we wanted. And when we changed the color, they were like, they never just said to us, by the way, like it's the powder coating that's the problem. It's not like us just being jerks, you know? Yeah, it's, it would be so easy. It would be so easy to just <laughs> tell us what the truth is. But uh, instead, there's this, there's this runaround, right? Okay, so the other thing that happened, this was, like I said, a very emotional email. And, and what Peter speculated and what, what I think he's probably right about is, you know, that these guys essentially lost the upper hand. They figured out that we figured out that there's other suppliers out there that can do this product cheaper, that can do it for the same quality. And they basically lost the upper hand in the relationship. They're feeling threatened by that. You know, long story short, Dan, what we did uh, was we went back to our supplier. I want to keep working with these guys because they are really good and because they do help us develop products. So there is advantages for us to working with them. But in our case, I think it's important that we promote some diversity in our suppliers so we don't get pinned like this because we just can't afford it. So we went back to them and we said, okay, we'll continue to order this product with you and we can promise you this kind of volume. By the way, though, we know now that there's a supplier out there that can make just as good of a product for $20 less a unit, and that saves us a lot of money every year. So we went back to them, and I think, you know, unfortunately they agreed, but I think unfortunately that the damage has been done, really. This is going to be a relationship of, I don't know, it's just going to be, it's not going to be a thriving relationship anymore, Dan, because we essentially did go behind their back and found this other supplier. But it wasn't because we wanted to be sneaky, it was because... They were screwing us on the lead times. Right. So it was them. It wasn't you, in other words. It was them, but ultimately, (laughs) everybody's going to suffer from it because, like you said, in these relationships, interested to know you know, other people's perspectives on this, but in these Chinese relationships that we have with these Chinese factories, there isn't a lot of transparency, man. Even after five years, we're still getting BS emails, and it's not the real reason, like you said, you know? And by the way, this is... Just to be clear, this is just another Wednesday. This is just a normal conversation that Ian and I would have off the podcast, back and forth. This is not really anything new. And there's no real clear answer to this. I mean, this is kind of an interesting topic for the show, I think. It's not part of a bullet point, really. I mean, it's just you can't say, like, diversify your factories because that can cause problems, too. Like you're saying, I mean, we run a pretty significant, you know, small business, but if we diversify our product line across two or three suppliers, it might not be significant enough for them to give us the level of service that we require. So, I mean, there's, you know, you, you kind of, there's no real right answer. There's no real right answer, stuff. man. And, you know, different factories work at different times, you know? So it's like, uh, luckily with this with this first factory, we've been lucky enough to like kind of grow as they're growing. So it's worked out. But like, if you grow faster than your factory, your fast factory grows faster than you, you know, a lot of times you find yourself looking for a new factory. I mean, there's, like you said, there's no right way to go about this, but guaranteed these kind of hiccups will come up and you will you will get your price threatened, you'll get your lead times threatened. I think the name of the game is just trying to find yourself in a position where you have as many options as possible. Before we jump into Valet Up updates, Ian, I want to share a quick tip for people that want to get into manufacturing but don't want to blow their 401k on it. So a lot of people listen to our drop shipping episode, and I think it struck a nerve with people. You know, people were th- you got them thinking, and I think the, the the message that you wanted to put out there, I think landed. So people actually came to me at a party and said, "I'm hearing you, but I, you know, fifteen thousand dollars. I mean, that's my living expenses for the next six months. How am I going to go spend that on a factory?" So. I think there's this powerful concept when you're starting with a supplier called the sample order, Ian. So you order a sample, one or two products, you work on the design back and forth, and you get it to production level. What's going to happen then is they're going to quote you and they're going to say, look, the MOQ is you know a $20,000 order, basically. And or they're going to be on Alibaba and they're going to see that the MOQ is twenty thousand. Exactly, units. and to anybody looking to get into manufacturing, our, our message is the MOQ is not the MOQ. And I think the approach is look like, of course, they want a twenty thousand dollar order from you. That's how they roll. I mean, but don't you think they'll take thirty five hundred or whatever? So I, mean, I think the way to frame it to get this done is to call it a sample order. It's very common in a lot of industries to run 100 units to go out to dealers, to go out to retailers, to go out to your sales force. And I think that that's how you frame it up so you can reduce your cash burden and get that manufacturing going without blowing the 401k. 
I'll give you a specific example of that. When we first went to production, our first production run with the flash bar, which we talked a little bit about last episode, you look at that product, it's stainless steel. So we had to find a new stainless steel factory. And we did find one in China, but they were very small and they were very new. What I wanted to do initially was I wanted to go to a factory in China that manufactures restaurant supply equipment because they're well experienced at manufacturing these kinds of products and working with stainless steel. The problem is that we didn't have the volume. So we went to them and we said, this is what we want to produce. And they said, yeah, of course, the MOQ is, you know, 300 units or whatever. So we had to find a factory that was new enough and small enough that wanted to grow with us. And so that's that's the other side of this, Dan, is uh, finding aligning with a factory that wants to grow with you. We found a very small factory that was willing to meet our price and also our very small MOQ. Very cool. So Ian, let's talk a little bit about valetup.com, the software we're developing with Dom Inter, Jesse Lawler, and uh, Taylor has been helping us out tremendously. Uh, he's been running the whole thing. Helping. <laughs> where, where is that Funny. guy? Let's talk about some, some things that we've learned by trying to get our first SaaS product off the ground. So first news update, three companies have purchased the hardware. So that's Really good news. When you install Valet Up at your location, you got to install the hardware, right? It's not just a matter of putting it on your iPhone and running. It's a matter of getting set up with the kiosk and the point of sale system. The hardware is uh, interesting. So Valet Up recap, it's a piece of software that helps Valet companies manage revenue. That's, that's it. Uh, it does a lot of other things, but managing revenue is the number one thing. Stopping employee theft is a big problem for this industry. The hardware is iPads and iPods and iPhones, uh, primarily iPads. So when this system first came out, it wasn't our system, but you know this system's been around for 10 or 15 years. I mean, it started with big computers. Now it's kind of shifting onto the uh, iPad in most cases. So there's a hardware cost associated with the SaaS product. In, and I think that initially we didn't really consider that, but when you look at it, it's like, hey, these guys, these valet companies are going to have to spend $1,000 to get set up in hardware, and then they're going to go buy your product. So your product isn't really just $2.99 a month. It's that $1,000 setup, and it's, then it's that $2.99 a month. So one of the things we're looking at right now to help ease that is uh, rental programs and uh, kind of lease to buy. So if we, one of the things that we're, we're noticing for some of these smaller companies is like if we can reduce the upfront burden – the uh, barrier to entry is much lower. One of the other lessons that we've learned has come through this process that I think is awesome. Taylor has been recording his sales phone calls and you guys have been reviewing them together. What have you learned from, from doing that? I mean, I think this is a really cool thing to do with your staff. Yeah, a lot, obviously. You know, I just listened to a call the other day, consultant in the uh, parking industry, and he had a lot of great things to talk about. So one of the other things that I'll talk about with Valley Up, this is our payment our payment processing idea. So when we first got into the idea of Valley Up, we thought, hey, this is kind of cool. We want to be on the front of payment processing for this industry because we're going to be managing the workflow and we're also going to be managing the payments. So it makes sense for us to become a payment facilitator. And this parking guy gave us a lot of great insight into why that might not be the case. And this just goes to show you, Dan, is like from the outside looking in, like you just have no idea, you know? Like I sat down for like so many days and so many hours trying to figure out this payment facilitator relationship. We got the relationship going, contracts all over the place, you know, a lot of it could have been a waste of time because one call with this consultant and we learned the real reason why we might not want to become a payment facilitator. I don't know if you want to go into that, but it's, it's kind of boring, but... Which is why, I'm, well... I it's kind of interesting. You were basically saying that the the people who own the property rights often own the payment processing rights as well, and that can be the case for an entire city. So if we've yeah we've got big parking clients in major cities, if X you know merchant bank or X basically investment bank owns the real estate, then it's not going to happen for us. So you know if you've got a I didn't even know this, but if you if you've got a mortgage out on a property and you're operating a business on that property, they they might force you into using their merchant bank and their payment facilitator program because they want to see exactly how much revenue you're making to make sure that you can cover the mortgage. And so then it's a deal breaker if you force people to use your payment processing system, right? They have to use right. um, the payment processor that um, gives them their mortgage. So 
again, you know, lesson learned there is like, you just never know until you talk to people and you get into it. Like you might think it's a great idea to take payments and to like skim a little bit off the top here, but like it's, it it could be a no-go for the whole operation. So we've been noticing, we can go into depth about the, the UI stuff, I think in the future, but we've been winning on design and some people might be curious as to why we only have three paying customers. Well, you know, a, a month ago, we rolled back the entire software in order to simplify things to basically readdress the market. So the MVP, in other words, wasn't so minimum, and we needed to roll back a lot of the features that we were coming out with. So design is winning us these clients. So we're kind of at a little bit of a restart point, but with a lot of positive feedback and positive momentum. Let's talk about the deal making. We've got a test at a company with 100 locations in San Diego, a lesson in the power of persistence and of calibration. Let us know how that went down. Taylor, Taylor's been working for us to get set up at these test locations. So our process basically is this. We've got the website up, but the website really doesn't do anything. That's the truth, right? Some people are finding us through it. But what's really working is uh, for us to contact our existing list of valet parking providers and try and schedule a demo. And that's that's been really good to us. So um, Taylor will get on the phone, he'll do a demo, and then he'll get lots of great insights into what the product needs. And specifically, this group in San Diego, you know, we did the demo and uh, then it came down to, well, what is it? What do we need to do in order to make this system viable for you guys? And then we'll go back to our development team and Jesse and we'll say, these are the five things that we need to implement. If we can do it, we can get XYZ company on there. A little story about these talks and specifically closing. Uh, One of the things that Taylor and I have been talking a lot about is closing the deal, Dan, and you know about this. I think it's really important when you're on the phone with somebody or when you're trying to work a deal to try and figure out what the closing point is and try and calibrate to them and figure out how, how you can both come to that agreement. And one of these meetings that Taylor was in, he was telling me about it. The location basically said, we don't have a location that you guys can set up at because we don't have credit card processing yet. And so Taylor basically left that meeting with his head down saying, oh, bummer, we don't have credit card processing yet. We just can't work with this company. And we got on the phone and we talked about it. And it was just as simple as this, going back to the company and saying, what location don't you have credit card processing at that we can test this at? (laughs) And that seems real simple, but he went back to that company and he said, just that. And they said, oh, yeah, we got this location that we can test at, you know. The lesson there is this, it's power of persistence and it's calibration. And it's also critical thinking during deal making, right? Like you have to be thinking about the end goal and how you can get there and calibrating off what the other party is saying. So uh, it just didn't hit him. And, you know, it's, I think it was a great lesson for Taylor. And now he knows next time he gets to that point. And he was actually, you know, it worked out fine. He was able to salvage the deal and get it done. But it's just a matter of critical thinking on your feet when you're in these conversations. Very cool. So, Ian, speaking of a, a critical engagement, do, how do you think Colby's feeling about this episode? I mean, I feel like we've, we've we're, just, <laughs> we're, going, we're we're all over the place. we're all over the place, man. Hey, before we get off the show, man, I want to talk about a few things, two things: how we're currently managing our staff to manage this year-over-year growth. But first, give us a Mangria update. A lot of the podcast listeners know our love affair with Adam Carolla. We sent the guy a free bar. That might be paying off for us. Yeah, I think it might be. Now we're getting into the portable bar company. So I, I hope this is a good episode, and I hope it goes as well as the starters for the rest of us episodes go. But yeah, we do have a lot of stuff going on here. And one of the things that we have going on is the portable bar company. We talked a little bit about it last time. We went to um, this trade show. We met our goals, and now we're going back to another trade show in two weeks, and it is called the Nightclub and Bar Show. And so... Yeah, let's not be so coy. We're... we're <laughs> Me, me and you are like just just bullish on trade shows, man. Are we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really? I mean, come on. We've got a plan, man. We're, this is systematic. Let's go to one as as often as we <laughs> possibly can without abandoning the phones. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a right, bit so of a case to... of irrational exuberance right now. It's like we'll go to any <laughs> yeah. show. We're going to take this stuff to to SEMA. See how it goes. <laughs> so, all right. So we uh, we sent. Uh, I did this on your behalf. We sent Adam Krola a bar when Mangria first came out, and it was a Mangria branded bar, and we say congratulations. We're huge fans of what you do. Here's a bar for a Mangria. Well received. We did the follow-up. I think we talked about that on the podcast yep. at one point. 
they've bought a couple bars from us in the meantime. And uh, we noticed when we signed up for this trade show that they also have a trade show booth at the nightclub and bar show. And so what happens at a lot of these shows is they're big shows and you try and get as many eyes on your products as possible. So if there's an opportunity to have your products at another booth, a lot of times these guys that go to these trade shows, they will offer to put flyers or girls or bars or whatever it is in other people's trade show booths to get as much exposure as possible. And so we contacted Corolla's people and we said, hey, do you guys have your displays yet for the nightclub and bar show? And they said, no, uh, we don't. And we said, okay, how about we do a Mangria branded flash bar and we put that up in your booth. And while we're doing that, we're going to put a girl there that passes out flyers that says, hey, this is a portable bar company flash bar. Come over to our booth. And they said, great. And so the advantage for them is that we, and Dan, you know how expensive this stuff is. We're supplying them essentially with all of the equipment they need, they need to display their drinks at their Mangria booth. And uh, what we're getting from it is double exposure. So we get to have two flash bars at the show instead of just one. Hey, this is a great idea that people I think could apply any way that you could facilitate another company's trade show experience as an opportunity for you to get your products in front of a captive audience. I think that's really cool. I mean, it could be, you could provide concession. I mean, this stuff's expensive to, to ship it in, to pay the union rates, to do all that logistical stuff. So if you can make that easy on us, then that's pretty cool. In terms of uh, internet marketing speak, this is a JV. <laughs> wow. Doing a JV with Corolla. Wow, boss man, you're really coming along there. I like you. It's very seamster of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One final thing, you know. So all this, all this, you know, work we've been doing years of years is just it's really starting to pay off, show dividends. Uh, and one of the ways that we're coping with that is is growing the team. And I think it's maybe just worth it to share how we're currently managing the teams. I mean, a lot of times in our community, people avoid hiring. They put it off for way too long because, you know, the management was what you did in your real job. And now that I've got a business, I don't want to manage people. And boss man, in our business, our biggest investment is our team and they represent the biggest upside potential for our businesses. So I'm curious, you know, how, how are you currently approaching management? With a lot of phone calls. So you and I both get on phone calls now. I don't know what your day is, but my day is uh, Tuesday and Friday. Now that I'm back in San Diego for the month of March, it'll be mostly in person. You know, every time you hire somebody, it's not just to do a job within your business, right? You're hiring people to teach them what you know about your business. You're hiring people... I, I think in a lot of cases to mentor them because they're interested in uh, becoming who you are. You're hiring people to take on kind of their own approach to your business. So it's like, I guess the the bottom line with hi- with hiring is it's going to mean more management time. And, and like you were saying, you know, like you don't just hire people to like let them do whatever they do. Like when you hire somebody in our business, Dan, we expect that we're going to spend tons of time with that person, grooming them, getting them up to speed, having them learn about our business. It's just like... It's, it's like a full-time job, basically. When you get to the level that our business is, is going to, to just manage people, yeah. right? Well, I mean, and it doesn't need to be such a, a dire thing. I mean, Tuesdays and Fridays, we're talking two days a week, the biggest investment in your life. I'm not, it's not like you're sitting there for eight hours a day checking off TPS reports. No, no, not at all. I want to be clear about that for sure. Yeah. But when I say, when I say a full-time job managing people, that's like the best thing ever. Right, I mean it's it's awesome because uh, these people are building the business with you. You're providing guidance. And we just added another team member to the the Dynamite Circle staff. Alex is going to be helping us with content, all kinds of exciting things, this podcast, etc. Met up with him in the Philippines a week ago. Introduced him to all these things. You know, walked him through the principles. You know, the listeners of this podcast episode one thirty four got him. We went right to the strategic operating document. Read the mission. Read the principles. Walked through every process. Fine tuned it. Asked ourselves the question: Who's going to do it? What day are they going to do it? And we check up on those things. So in my case, it's Tuesdays one on ones, Fridays team call, and then. SOD, which gets updated with discussion items throughout the week and processes get tweaked, and then HipChat for day-to-day. I know you're using HipChat too. It's sort of 
really sweeping through like a sort of a wildfire through our community. But I got that on my phone. So I've got little like when someone mentions me in a chat, I get a, a ping on my mobile handset. And I love that because I, as a team leader, I hate the idea that I'm holding up the team because I didn't answer something. So my my message to them is, you know, anytime you want to ping me, hip chat me. That's cool. Do you have that hooked up on your phone yet? Yeah, I do. I mean, most of the time I'm in front of my computer, but yeah, we use HipChat all the time for sure. I mean, you still use Skype, but uh, HipChat is great for uh, conversations because you can kind of closet things off and it it stays out of the email. So I I find, Dan, the less emails that I get every day, the better for me. Just disappears into my inbox, basically. My email is like a gnarly triple canopy jungle, man. (laughs) I I cannot go into there. (laughs) It's bad. Uh, HipChat has absolutely reduced the amount of email traffic between the team, and that's huge. And again, it, what I like about it is the linear nature of the conversation. So I love it when a team member steps back and writes a big project email, but that can tend to be like a bomb in the middle of that triple canopy jungle, and you go in there trying to find it. But on HipChat, it's like you make a new room about a project. Like we've got a room about DCBKK that's coming up in October, and it's linear. You go in there, hey, here's the next item. Here's the next item. You can go back, you can look at all the links, you can look at all the reference points. To me, that's way better than an email chain sitting in the middle of 100 unread messages in my inbox. So HipChat for me has been a management breakthrough, especially as the team grows. I just want to say another thing about overview management slash some of these businesses that are that we're building, Dan. And I think this is just a cry to action to people that don't have uh, teams yet and people that are maybe ambivalent or not sure if they need a team yet. The team is the best thing that's happened to our business because it's legitimized our business. It's not just me and you derping around talking about you know wild ideas. It's actually rubber to the road. Once you get these people in your business working, it, it also creates a bit of accountability. We are now accountable for, I, I don't know, geez, Dan, what, 15 people or more yeah. in our business? And we're accountable for our ideas, for our visions, things like that. It really holds our feet to the fire because we, we've got a lot of people involved in our business. And I think it's been a real motivator for me to, to do that. And I think, you know, when you look, depending on what your goals are, you know, maybe you want to be rich, maybe you want to travel. All these things can, in in our view, have improved with the hiring of employees, right? Yeah, and the good news is we've freed up some time to derp around and talk about wild ideas once a week here on the podcast. So I totally agree with you. I mean, if, if there's any theme here that we've been expressing time over time, it's the precise things that so many people in our community avoid that will set you free. It's taking greater responsibility. It's setting higher goals. It's hiring the team and implementing the processes. These are the things that end up setting you free. Like you said, derping around, if you wake up every morning and wait for yourself to have a sense of kick-ass energy and I'm going to go crush it today, well, good luck with that because the fact is you're not going to want to crush it every single day. It's a matter of having the goals in place, following the metrics, trust the process, hire the people. And then you can dart around all you want and start a podcast. All right, boss, man, we are just rambling on. Hopefully next week we can get back to the process, man, and, and, and focus on some maybe some tangible takeaways. If you guys have questions for us, we would love to dig into our businesses, share something with you. Let us know what you want to hear about at tropicalmba.com slash updates. Also, feel free to give us a call, 888 888- Five five four eight four two eight. The boss man loves voicemail. That's it. Can I say one more thing? Yeah, it's your show, man. You can do whatever you. One more thing. <laughs> Have you listened to the Champs podcast yet? I haven't, man. I can't. I can't stress the Champs podcast enough. So, all right. All you got to do, Dan, is listen to one episode. This is the episode that I want you to listen to. I want you to go to the Champs podcast and listen to the Arsenio Hall podcast. Arsenio Hall, he tells a great story, Dan, that I think is extremely entrepreneurial about how he got his start. I won't go into it in detail, but basically, Jay Leno said, hey, call me when you get out here. He ends up in Los Angeles, calls Jay Leno, ends up on the back of his motorcycle, brings him around, finds him a hotel or an apartment to live at. Jay Leno and Arsenio Hall, they both hold court. Um, and I think you and I have held court several times over the last couple of years. And holding court means you sit down with more junior entrepreneurs and you kind of tell them about your experiences. And so 
Really interesting to hear Arsenio Hall's experience becoming an entrepreneur, becoming an entertainer, and how it's so similar to what happens in our community and how it's so relevant because we're all helping each other become better entrepreneurs and becoming entrepreneurs in the first place. So give Arsenio Hall a listen. You will hear how similar his story is to a lot of entrepreneurs that we talked to today. All right. So, boss man, we'll link up that episode, tropicalmba.com slash updates. Any other parting shots besides go make a cold call, go hire some people, make some process. That's it. Install hip chat. Do all that stuff. Only four bucks a month per seat. Is it two bucks? Don't buy the 4.6 liter. <laughs> Don't buy the Go for the 5.7. 5.7 all the way. All right. Well, boss man, have a great time. Great. Uh, good luck racing. All right. <laughs> That's, that's it. Anything else you want to say? That's Nothing? it. Tropicalavier.com slash updates. We'll see you next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Go make a cold call. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tropical MBA podcast. You can go to tropicalmba.com, get access to hundreds of back episodes and all kinds of other goodies. Load up your iPod. That is the cheapest way to fly business class on your next international flight. We will see you next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.